you heard, I am fortunate to be a pediatrician in the Yukon where I work on the lands of the Kwantlen Dunn First Nation and the Tongkwachin Council. And much of my work is with First Nations and, and learning and taking their wisdom into what we do. So I'm hoping today to sort of share three stories that I hope will illustrate a bit of what you're saying and, and provide our perspective from the CMA about how we see the path forward. So first I'd like to share a little bit about what I see on the front lines of work as a pediatrician in the Yukon. Um, so many of the things that we talk about or think about, about why people are healthy, really are part of my day-to-day -day work. So I work largely with children who are intergenerational survivals of residential schools. They've been impacted by colonialism. And it's not uncommon for me at the end of a day of clinic to see, you know, many of the children I saw have been directly also impacted by current things like the opioid crisis. They may have lost a parent uh, to overdose, or they may have lost a parent to the prison system, or they themselves are now in care because their parent is unable to care for them because of their struggles with addictions, which of course link back to those social determinants. But what's been interesting in the pandemic is as we've tried to access services for those children, it's become very challenging because our healthcare systems become so overwhelmed. And some of the factors like regulatory barriers prevent us being able to get kids the things they need. So if I'm reaching out to a team at BC Children's Hospital who's maybe able to provide a higher level of care for a child with a complex mental health problem, I'm told, oh, I'm sorry, we can't support your patients virtually because we're not licensed to practice in the Yukon. Just last week, we had a suicidal child admitted to our hospital, and we were unable to transfer her uh, to the actual psychiatric ward at BC Children's Hospital because there was no space. So these are the types of things that we're dealing with when we're trying to get children and youth uh, the help that they need, and these are issues that affect rural and remote physicians across the country. The next story is about a physician who reached out to me last week. This was a, a woman, a doctor from Richmond Hill, Ontario, She'd been a family doctor for 17 years, serving a panel of 3,000 patients. And she reached out to me to say, you know, I had to close my practice. I had to walk away, close the doors, because I am so burnt out and I feel so unsupported by government in my efforts to care for my patients that I just couldn't keep going anymore. And I had to start thinking of my own mental health and the health of my four children. And now I have this horrible guilt about the fact I've left these 3,000 patients without care. The next story is the story of our hospitals, and as we all know, they've been overwhelmed and even now remain at overcapacity in many places in the country. And the doctors and the nurses and all the other experts across healthcare professions that work in those hospitals are burnt out and exhausted. They're now also really worried about the backlogs that we're seeing across the system and how are we going to scale up the people that are there to continue to care for patients. I hear from surgeons who are deeply worried about their inability to get people in to be seen and get people off their wait lists and, and just not having access to the operating time that they need to get Canadians those really critical surgeries. And what we were reminded of this week at a summit we held on Twitter Spaces with the CMA from one of our patient advocates, and I think this is something that you will all relate to, is these, behind these stories are all people. Behind these numbers, you know, hundreds of thousands of Canadians waiting for care, five million Canadians without a doctor, these are people, these are human beings who are experiencing very real suffering and anxiety and stress about what the future of their health looks like. So when we sort of think about this picture, it probably won't surprise any of you to, to learn that our National Physician Health Survey that we recently released the results of showed that over 50% of doctors are experiencing severe burnout and almost half are considering cutting back on their clinical hours. And that is largely related to a system that does not allow us to meet the needs of our patients. And for us, that reality of the suffering that patients are experiencing every day is all too real because we encounter it in the work we try to do. Um, and it's very difficult to want to continue in a system like that. So I think the message for all of you today is that we really do have a human health resource crisis and a healthcare crisis on our hands that needs our immediate attention. It's at a scale that we haven't really seen and the fact that people are really thinking and about leaving healthcare because of it should be a cause for concern for all of us. We know that the healthcare system needs to be a priority and we need federal leadership to get our country back on track. These issues are at a level that no jurisdiction can handle on their own. But I have hope for the system and largely from some of the ideas that we've seen come forward from the NDP. And I think just even last week when we saw the, the agreement between the NDP and the Liberals around creating pharmacare and dental care in our country, this is the direction we want to go. This is about expanding our universal healthcare system, bringing more people in, providing more services to meet the needs of Canadians. 
That's what we want to be seeing. So I don't believe it's hopeless. So really, what, what is it that we want? We want healthcare workers to be able to do their job and meet the needs of patients. We want to be people-centered and person-centered, and we want those patients to be able to get care from a healthy provider who's able to meet them with empathy and center their care on what their needs are. And we need a system that allows those healthcare workers to do that without destroying them as people. So what are some of the solutions that we have at the CMA or things that we've been talking about that we want to share with you today? One is the need for integrated human health resource planning. We know that we need to work in teams. We know that there's not enough doctors, nurses, clinical counselors, occupational therapists, and the list goes on and on across this country. But what we do not have is a national plan of how many, who, what types, and where they should be. So it's hard to solve a problem if you don't have a clear plan about how you want to get there. So we're calling for leadership there. We're calling for national licensure. We can take away these regulatory barriers that I talked about and allow healthcare workers to be available to patients when and where they're needed, and that can allow us to improve access to care and the mobility of our health workforce. And also critical is primary care reform. Primary care is the foundation of our healthcare system. Our vision is that all Canadians have access to a primary care physician or primary care team, and those teams need to be integrated. They need to include other healthcare professionals so that patients with complex and challenging needs can get the care they need in a medical home. So I think the message really here is let's depoliticize health. Let's get together, let's find these solutions, let's work together, let's call on our federal governments to provide that leadership and find that path forward to health for all Canadians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for sharing your, your experiences and some ideas for steps forward. Our next speaker is Linda Silas. Thank you, merci beaucoup, Monica. Gros bonjour à tout le monde. Uh, I'm a francophone labor leader and a woman, so I'll do everything in English so you'll be within the seven minutes. Uh, I'm a proud New Brunswicker coming from the Mi'kmaq land, and I live also in Ottawa on the Anishinaabe and Algonquin uh, territory. So very pleased to be here. The question is, how did you experience or how are you experiencing the pandemic? Well, it's a balance of fear and how stupid can we be? Uh, SARS, H1N1, Ebola, we were all at the table from CMA to public health to every union across this country with the Public Health Agency of Canada sitting there and getting ready for this pandemic. But oh no, did we follow the science? No, 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 because we have too many politicians in this world that needed to get their 30 seconds of fame. So we never followed the precautionary principle so that's when I was spending sleepless night because that's what my members were wearing, garbage bags. Would you have put a construction worker with a, without the hard hat, the hard boots? No. Would you send a firefighter into a fire without the proper equipment? They wouldn't even consider it. Would you ask a police officer to go do a firefighter's job? You would never consider that. But in healthcare, you expect doctors, respiratory technicians, nurses, personal care workers, the uh, cleaning staff to do it all because we have this oath. Okay, I get upset with this. Then March 11, uh, 2020 happened. None of us believed it would be two years. None of us could imagine that we would be here two years plus later still fighting for PPEs, personal protective equipment. Can you imagine? You all have the luxury, if you don't have a proper N95 type respirator here, the office will give you one. Nurses and personal care workers today in long-term care facilities taking care of your grandparents have to fight for proper PPEs. It's shameful what's happening. We had the Public Health Agency of Canada did an amazing job protecting all of us living in Canada. Amazing job. I, I commend Dr. Tam and her team every day. But they sucked at representing and protecting uh, healthcare workers in this country. They suck and they have to admit it. And that's where we have to move forward from that. And then our poor seniors. 37,000 deaths at least and more in Canada due to COVID-19. 
over 3 million got sick with the virus. 50% of them were seniors. We put a very simple picture there of a se senior by themselves. We could have put the mortuary arriving at a long-term care facility, picking up bodies after bodies and bodies that died alone because we didn't take care of our long-term care sector properly. And that's a shame on all of us. We didn't take it properly and we should. As Dr. Pat Armstrong says, the condition of work are the condition of care. And that happens in our communities, in home care, in the long-term care, and the fanciest ICU in the country. We have to take care of our workforce that works so hard. The federal government right now is doing standards on long-term care. When I met the uh, federal health minister, Katrin met the federal health minister, probably many of you, and we're saying, Okay, I say strings attached to any dollars you send to the province and territories, but would they want to use fancy numbers, uh, fancier words? I'm okay with that. They're called standards. So for seniors, the standards have to be, yes, closer to home, but has to be on safe staffing, has to be to make sure we have enough hours of care to take care of you when you need it, and it has to be implemented in any money going to the province. Then I hear from my fellow Quebecers and other provinces like Saskatchewan, Alberta, oh, we don't want strings attached, we know what you're doing. Honestly, when you call the army to take care of your seniors, you've kind of lost the right to say you know what to do with federal health transfer on health care. You need health care. So what's happening to the workforce? You heard Catherine talk about physicians. We could go through every profession in healthcare right now, give you the same numbers. The burnout numbers pre-pandemic for nurses were 29% severe clinical burnout. That means they needed clinical help. It's not just me, I'm burned out today, I'm closing the door, I'm putting a movie on and a good glass of wine. That's not burnout, they need clinical help. That was pre-pandemic. December of, the, of last year, 45%. And can you blame them? Right now they're looking to go, oh, one minute, uh, oh, and you see I tell too many stories. Anyway, we, we need to move forward. The pandemic created the perfect storm. The perfect storm tells us, that uh, the polls tells us that one in two nurses have a plan and intention to leave. So imagine if 50% of Canada's nurses decide to leave, either go work in an agency, get double, triple, four times the salaries, or just completely go drive a truck, go do real estate. That's why we need the federal government there. Next, what we're asking the federal government is to look at Canada's healthcare workforce. Uh, we represent 10% of the Canadian, uh, Canadian workforce are healthcare workers. That's about 2 million workers. We have no appropriate data. We don't know who's going to retire in five years. We don't know the type of nurses we will need in five years. It's embarrassing. That's 8% of our GDP. And what is that created over the years? Shortage, surplus, shortage, surplus, shortage, surplus. And now we're in the worst shortage we've ever seen. What do we need from the federal government? We need an agency, a framework, call it what they want, but they need to bring all the experts. We are a small country. We're about the size of California in population. So we need all the experts in one room and the federal government to disperse the strategies and the funds attached to it. Hope, Katrin talked about it, that was hope last week. And that's what we all need is hope, for yes, finally a pharmacare. Usually I'm on the stage with uh, Monica talking about a national pharmacare program, but we need a national health human resource strategy to take care of all of us and make sure we're there and make sure we're not moving uh, deeper in the woods. So thank you very much. Merci. Hey, right. thank you very much, Linda. Definitely some some themes through through both of your talks and and lots of energy in the room now. Uh, our last speaker, we're going to be um, having a video presentation and uh, similar themes with I think a, a really important uh, perspective to bring. So Gabrielle Peters is a disabled writer, policy analyst, and a commissioner on the Vancouver City Planning Commission. 
She is co-founder of Dignity Denied and the Disability Filibuster and has been a leading voice in applying a disability lens to local, provincial, and national policy issues. Gabrielle's research and writing focuses on a radical theory of accessibility by integrating the lessons of disability justice, harm reduction, trauma-informed practice. She was lead author of the Broadbent Institute's policy submission to the BC government on future accessibility le legislation, co-author of the Vancouver City Planning Commission's report on extreme heat and air quality, and she testified before the Canadian Senate about the harmful impacts of Bill C-7. Her writing on disability has been published in the Maple McLean's Magazine, CBC, among others. My name is Dr. Ramona Coelho, and I am reading this speech by Gabrielle Peters. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to speak here today. I am speaking to you from the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. As a white disabled woman, I am cognizant that disability is a colonialist construct. Ableism is a tool of oppression, the harmful impact of which is not limited to disabled people. The mythology of an imagined white middle class abled as normal is a yardstick caked in blood. I am speaking as someone who is marginalized by poverty, excluded by ableism, and living in a province that is alienated by history and geography. A province of resource extraction and real estate speculation, get rich quick schemes and libertarian pipe dreams. From a distance, John Horgan may look like May, may look different from Doug Ford, but from the perspective of a disabled poor person, both men and their policies appear largely indistinguishable. BC is not better. Rejecting the science on masks, invisibilizing disabled people, refusing to disaggregate data, failing to act on ventilation, telling people to personal responsibility their way out of a pandemic, telling them to go outside and walk until they find some clean, cool air during a heat dome swirling with smoke from wildfire fires is not being kind, even if you say it in modulated manner. Nearly 600 people died in one week last summer from heat. All any of those people needed was in, to be alive today was an air conditioner. Sick and in need of help, they called 911. Hours passed with no one coming to save them. They died waiting. I don't like to speak about my own experiences because I know they are dismissed as anecdotal and because they fail to fully represent my knowledge on these issues. But I'm going to share some hoping you won't see them as personal experiences, but rather as glimpses into policy in the wild. Other than to be vaccinated, I have not left my tiny unit in a social housing complex since March, 2020. I have no balcony and the windows are not accessible to me. Actually accessible and actually affordable housing is a health issue. Outside feels relatively safe, but the small elevator and narrow hallways don't. I understand my neighbors can't afford masks. I have a harder time understanding the home care aides who wear them around their necks. And I have the most hard time understanding how a, go a government can mandate masks and then not provide them to the people who need them most and whose monthly government income is often insufficient to cover food. But that's a moot point now, since the projections are still being cast aside and in-person maskless events are sanctioned in facilities that two years into an airborne pandemic have done nothing to improve their ventilation. I was turned away at the vaccine clinic due to my complex medical history. It was left to me to create an alternative pathway to vaccination. Here's a quick version of what followed. My primary care physician closed her chain of clinics. Specialists demanded new referrals, which I could not get. Online options had changed and required credit cards to be kept on file. Walking clinics no longer really exist in Vancouver and physicians listed as taking new patients weren't. I am a non-ambulatory wheelchair user with a rare autoimmune neuromuscular degenerative disorder and multiple comorbidities living in Canada's third largest city without a doctor. On top of this, I need to counter that of a medical community that enthusiastically got behind Bill C-7 to extend state paid for and provided death to disabled people and only disabled people who are not near the end of life. 
They call it choice, but that implies that housing, services, supports, and income needed to, to live are provided, and they aren't. If a science-based doctor tells me I can't work, and the government will not provide me with the means to live in the com community in accordance with Article 19 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which part is it that you don't believe in? Science-based medicine or human rights? The number one thing our healthcare system needs is more money. Nothing gets better and many things get worse when a system is not funded in ways that respect the rights, needs, and health of those who is designed to serve and those who work in it. Do not go down the path of means testing for any aspect of healthcare. Universal healthcare means that it is universally covered. Everything provided to everyone, regardless of income, period. Here's the second part. We need scientists focused on human rights. We need healthcare integrated into the community for the sake of community and healthcare. Fund neighborhood legal, community, healthcare clinics, Neighborhood centers with primary care physicians, multidisciplinary healthcare workers, social workers, paralegal, and lawyers. I want to be very clear. I do not mean urgent care centers. We need longitudinal care. The exclusive focus on acute care has almost resulted in my death on more than one occasion. The lack of longitudinal care, particularly structured to support chronic conditions, actually is an upstream feeder of acute care. Community healthcare work centers that are designed to be an ongoing part of a person's life will lead to better lives for people in the community and the development of better policy at a municipal, provincial, and federal government level as the flow of information will be multidirectional. Fund healthcare. Fund it like our lives depend on it. No more dividing up which parts of the body will be covered. The brain is not separate from our bodies. Our teeth is not separate from our bodies. No more dividing up which kinds of science-based healthcare are universally available. What good is it to be diagnosed with a condition that requires ongoing physiotherapy if physiotherapy is not covered? At the end of the day, I am just a poor crip sitting in front of a screen, begging all of you to fight unapologetically for what is right. Stop arguing from the defensive. Demanding pu public funds be used to fund public services is not an immoral thing you need to apologize for. Greed is. Leaving people behind is. By the end of today, seven more people will die of toxic drugs in my province. Fund healthcare. Provide safe supply. Thank you. Gabrielle Peters. So I think Clearly, all three speakers have given us a lot to think about, and I, I wish we had more time to actually have more of a conversation, but we're at the end of this session, so if we can give everyone a round of applause just for sharing their thoughts. I think they've all made very strong arguments for, for publicly funded healthcare that needs to be better than it is now, so thank you for that. And now we are going to leave. I don't know how to end this. I'm not going to transition, sir, either. So I think we're done. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>